Hi, I'm Daryl Welk, Chief Technology Officer for Green Room Technologies. We're a firm that specializes in business viability for health tech companies through market and technology readiness. Recent U.S. government regulations require healthcare organizations and insurance companies to make patient data available through a FHIR API. Having been involved with FHIR standards since 2014, my role at Green Room is to help our clients understand how to leverage FHIR and other standards for both data exchange and creating new business opportunities. I'm going to use this diagram to talk about some of the pro problems caused by a lack of healthcare data interoperability in the past, and then how FHIR is helping to solve those problems today. I used examples of three healthcare organizations in the diagram. A hospital, where I've recently had surgery, a clinic on the left, where my dermatologist practices, and finally a health information exchange at the bottom. At the top of the diagram, we have me on the left and my doctor on the right. Uh, the EHR vendors in this example, Cerner and Epic, have each provided a web portal where my doctor and I can access my patient records. But as shown by the gray lines here, my data was only available through the software portal provided by that specific EHR vendor. My doctor or I could view my data on the screen, but only software provided by that specific vendor could analyze my data. And similar problems existed with insurance industry. My medical claims were only available to me through uh, software provided by the insurance company. At the bottom of the diagram, then, there's a need to transfer patient data from healthcare organizations to another or to insurance companies. This would be done in the past by fax, proprietary data formats, or by digital messages or digitized documents conform to early, earlier HL7 standards. Health information exchanges were created to improve their sharing of the data, but it was very complex. So the problem at the top you can see in the red circles is that both myself and my doctor have at least four different portals that I have to interact with to see my data. And then I cannot have third-party software to act on that data once I have viewed it. Okay, so how to solve, fire solve these problems? First, the government regulations require that my doctor and I have access to my patient data in the FHIR format, and that rather requiring me to use the portal software from the HR vendors, I can give permission to a third-party app to access my data. That third-party app just refers to the fact that the app was not developed and marketed by Cerner or Epic in this example, but uh, created separately by a separate organization. These third-party apps then comply with things like Smart on Fire or CDS hooks protocols that allow me to authenticate who I am and authorize the third-party app to work on my half, similar to what you do when you use Facebook to log into a third-party app. For example, my doctor and I can view my lab results in app on app in my iPhone, where my data can a copy of my data can reside. And the government regulations also require that third-party apps have access to my claims data from my health insurance provider. And health government regulations will also require that FHIR in the future be used to exchange data among healthcare providers and healthcare payers. So you can see that, that FHIR will have a big impact uh, on the interoperability. So how do we get these standards I'm talking about? So we start out with industry standard organizations at the bottom here. HL7 is the standard organization that created the base FHIR standards. So each of these organizations is creating base standards in, in a certain area of healthcare. We then have FHIR accelerator projects. So FHIR accelerator projects create FHIR implementation guides for specific use cases. For example, the Da Vinci project uh, started a couple of years ago to create implementation guides for exchanging data between healthcare providers and healthcare payers, such as insurance companies. We also have a, a FHIR at scale task force. And this task force is investigating the scalability of FHIR deployment. As you can see by the diagrams, if we begin to have me having access to my FHIR data across the country uh, and having analytics uh, software accessing my data uh, can be very complex and, and we require scalability. And then finally, the government agencies that actually set the interoperability rules. Uh, by the time the U.S. government agencies get around to actually defining the regulations, hundreds of, of healthcare organizations, standards organizations, vendors 
have created, designed, implemented, and tested the fire-based solutions. The two uh, government organizations you need to know about, ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, which coordinates exchange of healthcare data, is more of a technology organization. CMS administers Medicare and Medicaid chip and insurance marketplaces. So CMS is putting the pressure on the EHR vendors and the insurance companies to make the data available to the patients. Uh, we back up a minute and talk about the scope of fire. So the fire uh, standard itself is very broad. It covers, if we look at it in three dimensions on the, on the Y axis, the content covers structured clinical data that we talked a little bit about, but also covers text in the form of clinical notes, administrative genomics, a broad variety of types of data, the functions uh, that, that specific uh, fire API functions that are covered in the uh, fire API that we can talk about some other time, and then the use cases. So we've talked a little bit about provider to provider, provider to payer, et cetera. So that's the scope of fire. What's the scope of the ONC CMS rules as they exist today? A very small subset of fire capability is covered, as I show in the little red cube at the bottom, the left of this. Very specifically, current EHR certificate certification requirements are the content is US CDI, a subset of the data, healthcare data. Functions only cover read at this point, and then the use cases are fairly restricted. Okay, so let's talk a minute about the architecture of fire applications. So fire has been, de been designed around a REST API and a fire data model. The uh, lower right-hand corner here, we show the existing EHR companies have built a fire facade on top of their existing systems. So they map the data in their uh, unique databases into the fire data model, and then they make it accessible to applications over a REST API, which follows the, the standard uh, industry standards for REST APIs. Uh, and I can write a JavaScript app then that uses the Fire REST API to access the Fire data in Epic or Cerner. Uh, Smart on Fire app you'll API you'll hear about, which is a set of protocols that allow me to authenticate and authorize a third-party app to act on my behalf, as I mentioned previously. CDS hooks is clinical decision support, so I can register a module uh, Fire application to execute at some specific point in a workflow in the healthcare organization. For example, when a provider is doing a prescription to look, uh, to compare. And then finally, a fire bulk access API. So those are the APIs. We then have, uh, the industry has a Smart on Fire app gallery where you can write your Smart on Fire app and register it in that gallery so that people can use it, try it out in, on a sandbox. Fire database. Each of the vendors below also have their own app galleries where I can take my app once uh, I have completed the app, I can get it certified then with Epic or Cerner or some of the other uh, EHR vendors. Uh, most of the common languages are, are covered with a, a Fire library, so you can write your applications in many different languages. The lower left hand corner public test Fire servers. Uh, there's 29 reference servers out there that are accessible to the various uh, uh, applications for testing. Many of those public fire servers have been turned into commercial fire servers by companies like Health Samurai, OneUp Health, and Smile CDR. Also, the big tech companies, Google, Microsoft, and IBM also have fire databases servers that are now available. And then finally, the health insurance companies have I put a facade of fire API on top of the, their systems. So that's kind of the architecture. What are the, let me say a few words about the fire accelerator projects. There are six primary ones and they're being added every so often. Uh, this is our original diagram. Uh, the Argonaut project was the first fire accelerator project started four or five years ago, and it focuses on EHR patient data. Uh, the, the EHR vendors got together and decided the most important, along with the government, what are the most important data to be uh, from their databases to make available to me and my doctor. Uh, and Smart on Fire, CDS, are part of that standard. 
they are going to project then to, to find use the implementation guides for that. Uh, the Karen Alliance project focuses on getting payer claims data to me a, as a consumer. The lower right hand corner of the Da Vinci project focuses on exchanging data between payers, insurance companies, and uh, EHRs. And then there are three other projects, the Gravity Project that based, focuses on social determinants of health, Codex Project, cancer data, and the Vulcan Project, clinical research and clinical trials data. So you can see these, these each of these uh, fire accelerator projects then are working on uh, implementation guides, which, which eventually may become government regulations. So I'm excited about uh, uh, what's happening with this fire ecosystem. If you're in the healthcare industry, Green Room can help you understand the impact of this evolving ecosystem on the future viability of your business. Uh, we specialize in technology readiness, market readiness, and funding readiness uh, to help you make sure you've got the right product in the right market uh, and uh, funded properly. So uh, contact me today. And if you're interested, and let's talk about how Green Room can help you fire up your business.